We're talking today with Rabbi Leib Tropper, and the subject today is the perfection of imperfection, preparing for and the accountability for Rosh Hashanah and Kippur and the entire year. And part of that includes the concept of forgiveness, a very vital part of these days. So I'd begin by asking Rabbi Tropper, is there an obligation to forgive? Well, obviously you're asking parents whether uh, in, in crimes committed between one Jew and another. You're not talking about in, in tshuva, of course, we're obligated to ask Hashem to forgive. So you mean right now specifically this question is indigenous to the relationships between human, one person to another person and uh, Jews, one Jew to another, correct? Well, I am, I am asking that, but I'm also asking do we add, where do we understand that we have to ask forgiveness from? From Hashem, from God. Yes. Okay, so that's part of, obviously that's part of the tshuva, right? That's uh, the word tshuva by definition means to repent, and repent has some verbal component to it. And and it's not like it's, it, you know, it's Yom Kippur, it's a good idea, we ought to do this, but we have to do it. Right, right, right. Uh, tshuva, the Rambam talks about, clearly incorporates Vidu, the expression of recognizing the sin that we committed. So, and accepting upon oneself not to do it again. And regretting by in our davening, not just thinking in our heart, but regretting in our davening that we regret that we did something that offended our religion, Kaddish Baruch Hu, and what we were supposed to do in this, our mission in life. So forgiveness is part and parcel of the regret process? Correct, regret parcel. And and I guess and get the uh, the whole concept of tshuva is in the tshuva is is, 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 is exactly. So all right. But between one person and another person, one you and another, and the interpersonal relationships that we have with people, um, it the Rambam seems to say in he says that a person lo osur to be a zori and not be mochel. You shouldn't be cruel and not forgive. It's also it's prohibited. The Loshon HaMachaber, if I remember correctly, in Simon Tafresh Vav or Tafresh Yud, I don't remember exactly which Simon, but it was one of those two Simonim, says, V'hamoichel lo yehayach zori melemuchel. doesn't say the word Osir, if you notice. It's come and omitted that word. That is a very, very deliberate omission. He says, V'hamoichel lo yehayach zori. It doesn't say it's Osir. Lo yehayach zori. should not be cruel and not forgive. That is assuming that one has asked for forgiveness, or does he have to be proactive? Without asking for forgiveness, there's nothing to talk about. There's no reason to be mochel anyone. I mean, there's, there there's no obligation for a person to go before somebody and say, I, I'm asking you that you should ask me to mochel. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. That the Gemara has a story about that, but, but that, in the halachic sense, there's no obligation to do that. It's a wonderful, spiritual, great uh, virtue and gesture on one's part to forgive someone you know, we say in that video before death, we forgive everybody who ever offended me, even though you may have not been asked for forgiveness. But in halacha, there's no requirement to... And obviously, this, this gift of forgiveness that one may give does not include any monetary claims one has against another. It's only about personal feelings and so on and so forth. Word that was spoken... Feelings that were hurt even by innuendo, gestures that were made that hurt someone. Those are the things that this forgiveness helps. Um, but there, the reason that there is a reticence and a reluctance for people to ask forgiveness, I think there may be three reasons. One of them is, is because um, The person who's asking forgiveness may not feel that what he's done is so egregious and so terrible. And so to speak, we use the language of the street in high school. We say, he shouldn't be a baby. I just said that. So he, shouldn't be, he, shouldn't, he shouldn't be a baby. Why so sensitive? He shouldn't be so sensitive. And him or her admitting to something they did wrong and that they're insensitive to say, I am insensitive. It doesn't matter that I, he shouldn't be sensitive or she shouldn't be sensitive, I am insensitive, that's a hard thing for them to say, that they think of themselves as insensitive, you know, very insensitive and caring and, and, you know, so that's one of the things that holds us back from asking the forgiveness. The other thing which is really, um, is that people, in general, I think people um, feel like foolish, you know, for getting upset sometimes. I, I, something you, A, would say to B, and B gets upset. And um, 
And I said it to someone else because I was upset. I was upset, so I said it to B. I said, B, you're really... I said, so why did I lose myself? I mean, mm. it doesn't sound... Well, I mean, I don't know why. I'm such a, like, a small-minded person to get upset about that and hurt his feelings. I mean, so we don't want to acknowledge that so much um, because it makes us feel to ourselves our self-value, self-worth kind of is diminished by acknowledging that. The other thing, of course, is is that we sometimes feel a sense of justice in, you know, Chavetz Chaim talks about this a number of times in the Sefer Shemir Salash, and we get that we get a sharp word in, we get it, we do it right, we get say you, let, let them have it, you know, kind of. I I I I, I have a, a real a reaction, uh, not a good one, when I hear people say to me, um, you know, I don't mince any words. So if I have the moment, if I have the opportunity because of the personality of the individual I'm talking to, I try to tell him or her in a nice way, say, yeah, that's called, in other words, it's called enos devarim, mm-hmm. not mincing any words. There so should be an effort to choose your words when you speak with someone and not offend them, not hurt their feelings. So um, as I mentioned to you just now, that's one of the feeling of justice. We don't choose our words. We, I don't mince any words. I just say it the way it is. We're very proud, and I never. I, when I ask the question, how does that, how does that, kind of fit in with the concept of a nas dvarim, which there's so many love in, to be depending on who you're saying bad words to, and even say for I think in Simon Laman Hay, Reish Laman Hay, Laman Hay says that even gestures that are disapproval to someone may be an iser of a nas dvarim daraisa. If you make a, a look of disappointment or disgust at someone, we think, well, I'm not saying anything, but according to say for that look. That expression may be worse than words that are spoken. If looks could kill. Right, if looks could kill, exactly. And they do. It's like what Rabbi Talishkin wrote in the name of his book, right? I think in the flap he writes. Words that hurt, words that heal. Words, right, and that, so in that flap he writes, I think in the, he writes, um, he says, Nicks, uh, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never harm me is not true. Mm. It's very true. So... In any event, so that is one of the, re- the re- medicines and reluctance some people to ask for forgiveness. The result of forgiveness, and this is very important to notice, because this is a very important chiddish of Rabbi Shor Salanter, that when a wife forgives her husband, or a husband forgives a wife, or a friend forgives his friend, Harusa forgives his Harusa, a Rebbe, a Talmud, a Talmud, a Rebbe, whatever it may be, there is a prohibition. Rabbi Shor Salanter writes, it's in the Sivas Oyer, written by his Talmud, Mitzel Petterberg, he writes that it's a prohibition, and he considered it very severe, Rabbi Shosalanta, for the person ever to mention it again. To ever mention that, he said, let's say something else happens three years later. He said, you know, this is not the first time it happened, the second time it happened. Once you forgave him for that that happened in the past, this is the first time that it happened. There is a tendency to do that. So in other words, post-forgiveness, there's That's a whole- exactly the point. That's the word, post-forgiveness, Everybody is like kind of, it's like, it's, like, it's like the cleaning of a calculator. Like you press C on the calculator, it's just clear. Or you don't call it back to find out what the other... Exactly. You press it. clear, you press C on the calculator, and then it's gone. Yeah, that, how about that should be the case, but apparently it's not. In, in well, that's why, I'm, that's why I'm bringing up Abishos Alanta's remark. I mean, it's, it's right here. I brought it with me, but I don't think I have to read it to everybody. It's right here in the Nesivas or Abishos Alanta considered it Godol Avoyne Minasoy. It's, it's an unbearable sin. And he compares it, actually, parents. He compares it to someone, let's say I would come to you and I owe you $2,000. And <clears throat> I would say to you, parents, you know, I'm really in bad shape. So you'd say, parents, Rabbi, Rabbi Trapper, forget about it, like they say in Italian. Forget you about you it. Alone. Yeah, forgive the loan. Exactly. So, fine. I'm very happy. I said, I can't thank you enough, parents. It's wonderful. I really took a pressure from me and from my spouse. It's wonderful. And then six months later, you come and say, where's my money? Rishos Salanta calls him a Ghana, a thief. The person who asks post, post for giving a loan, he asks him the money, he's a Ghana, he's a thief. No less than a thief. Because th- there's no money to talk about anymore. There's nothing to talk about. That's how he compares, that's what he compares Mechila to when somebody hurts you with his words and you forgive him. It doesn't exist anymore. And like you said, it's often, or actually most of the time, that's not the way people treat it. But would that be similar to what uh, Rabbi talked about before that 
in terms of emulating a Kaddish Baruch Hu. When he forgives us, he doesn't recall past transgressions. Actually, we want a Kaddish Baruch Hu to recall past transgressions. We want to. It's just the opposite. In a sense, when a Kaddish Baruch Hu forgives us, it's forgotten in the sense that we are not guilty of anything. But we want a Kaddish Baruch Hu to say, Rabbanu Shalaylam, thank, thank whoever, whatever, that I'm able to go and change my life. Mm. I want you to remember that oh. I was once not able to change my life. And now, thank God, I'm here as a new person. I'm, I'm, I'm in your embrace. Please hold on to me, Rabbanu Shalom. Don't lose me. Don't abandon me. So we want a Kaddish Baruch Hu to, to remember what, what we were like in order for us to get kind of compounded reward when a Kaddish Baruch Hu thinks, about, wow, I can't believe how this person made such an effort to make changes in their life. It's wonderful. So it, there's a fascinating, I mean, I, 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 there's a fascinating um, a result that I, I never saw it, but I heard it from a very big Talmud Chacham in Eretz Yisrael. This may be, I, I don't know how to say this, this may be like really uh, earth shattering. This may be volcanic, in a sense, uh, expression of uh, tshuva. Um, he says, uh, the Pasuk says in Tehillim, Kilo Yidach Mimenu Nidach. God doesn't reject anyone. What does that anyone mean? God doesn't reject anyone. He says, Afilu, even, Oysa Ish, Yemach Shemoy. We say that while we're like, right? That person, Jesus, even he is not eternally pushed away from God if there's some way of his return. Imagine someone who took Jews, slaughtered them, seduced them into doing all kinds of terrible various of idolatry, and kiloidach mimenu nidach. The Gemara says, as well in Sanhedrin, that the Gemara said, Shuvu bona, Kajbohu called out to all those re- rebellious children, Shuvu bonim shoivivim. My rebellious children t- come back. Chutz mi acher, except for acher, Elisha ben Avuya. And the Shalom Kodesh writes on that Gemara. You can take a look in the Shalom Luchas Labris. He writes it there. He says, True, God said he can't come back. But if he would say to him, No, I am coming back, Kajbohu even makabalim. It's a little paradoxical, but nonetheless, it's, it's remarkable. God, sometimes God wants you to say, no, I want to, some people, this is an experience where God wants you to defy his wishes. I'm not taking no for an answer. That's the love that a man has for Kodesh Baruch I'm not taking no for an answer. I'm going to go and do tshuva. And then he says, you go bishulei hakeli. You go like, like go entering from the bottom of the kalim, making a, penetrating a hole from the bottom, not going directly in. From the bottom... And he could, even that person could enter into Gan Eden and have a share in Olam Haba. Even Acher, with the, I, I invite you all to do tshuva. But I'm not inviting Acher. Don't invite me. I'm coming anyway. Ebishter wants to hear that. He loves to hear that. At least according to the Shalah Kaddish. And the powerful words that I just told you from, I heard from the Rizal regarding Oisei Ish, that's an unbelievable uh, <laughs> unbelievable thing to even think about how much the person turned the world around into Christianity into other things and took Jews with him. I wasn't just the Goyim. Christianity may be a wonderful thing, but for Jews, that's seduction away from the Torah. So, um, th- there is a, there is something very special about asking mech- asking Mechila re- specifically from God and which w- will also relate to interpersonal relationships particularly with a spouse. Particularly with a spouse. Yes. When I said particularly with a spouse, in regard to interpersonal relationships, it specifically it relates to a spouse. But when, they be, when the, the Chazal have a lotion for a person who has an opportunity to ask forgiveness and doesn't ask forgiveness, he's called a moirid. means a rebellious person. Hmm. There is a fascinating story in the Gemara about in the time of the Beis HaMikdash, when one of the great Tanoim went to visit the Melech in regard to stopping the, taking over Yushalai, excuse me, and destroying the Beis HaMikdash. And he called the Malka, he called him a Melech. He said, Melech, this is very kind of the last, the ninth inning of the, so he said, the Melech said back to him, he said, Imalka, no, if I'm a king, where have you been up to now? 
Subhan Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah when we say Hamelech, we should, we, should, we, should, we should say, where was I up to now? I was busy with so many other things of distraction that I thought that were, were, were really ancillary things in my life were not even secondary importance and they were just, I was just busy and I had this distraction. But Imalka, no, if, I'm, if you really considered me a Melech, where were you till now? Where were you? We have to answer that question. But if you don't ask Mechila from Rabban Yishlam on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, then we are called Murdim, because Kosh Baruch was right here. Dushu Hashem B'yimotzei, Kiruhu B'yayzekarv, is referring to Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Yimei Elul. If we ignore that, so, so, so then we are, we're just rebelling against God. We say, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. When you have an opportunity to ask your spouse, each, the, the wife, the husband, and the husband, and the wife, ask Mechila, and they're stubborn about that. I'm not going to go and, you know, I'm not going to, if I do this, she'll, she'll never learn. If I do this, he'll never learn. Mm -hmm. they, if they do that, they're considered murder. And then they're not in the, in the concept of a person who has, a, has an integrity in Ben Adam La Chavere. Ben Adam La Chavere says, I don't want the person, my spouse, to be upset. I want to ask him, Mechila. What the other person does, that's, it, that's their business. I don't want that person I'm a married. I'm an opportunity to make to, to, to make shalom, to do something that's nice, to make. To, it's just an unbelievable opportunity to to being the biggest brach in the world. Kash Baruch says nothing in the world like shalom. Kash Baruch says most likely machzik brach like shalom. Kash Baruch hasn't found a vessel that holds on to a blessing more than shalom. And when I have that opportunity in these days right now, and I just ignore it, I'm a married in the virtue, all the virtues that are involved in Adon Lachaberi. So. How would one then understand, then, and continuing with what Rav is saying, um, how do we understand then forgiving another, another Jew before these days? How do we understand the, the impact of it, as you're saying, and this concept of perfection of imperfection that a person should think? Right, that was a perspective I wanted to share with you um, as how the one who is forgiving should look at the one who is coming to ask forgiveness. Look what he did to me. Look what this she did to me. Look, I mean, how, how could it be? My spouse did this. My friend did this. My, my uh, how could that be? I mean, I, how, how do I look at it? Ain't tzaddik ba'aretz hashayasa tayvul yechta. The DNA of human beings are that they make mistakes. They made a mistake, and that success the mistake is going to bring them to great success. Bez Hashem, they are going to live their humanness in them, and they're going to say, "I'm sorry." That imperfection is really the perfection because th that's what Hashem is no tzaddik but Shias That is the, the perfection is being imperfect, but recognizing the imperfection, recognizing the imperfection, and not have the haughtiness and 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 and, and perverted arrogance to, to to no no I'm not I'm I'm never I'm never I'm, I, I know some people like that in my experience unfortunately that um, they're never wrong they misunderstood everything else but not wrong. I know somebody who thought he was wrong once and he thought no he was wrong once. <laughs> Very well put, but it's unfortunately experienced often that people have this arrogance of saying, "Well, I, I'm not wrong. I mean, I, I may be misunderstood, or I meant to do this, but never to say the words, utter the words, I am sorry. I'm the I'm the perfect, imperfect human being in the world. I'm one of those. That's what a I mean. That's that is the DNA of the Kashbaruch put into human beings. That is tremendous. So recognizing that." Takes a lot from a, from a person. The other thing is, what's most important, is to remember that when you ask forgiveness, you have to ask forgiveness. You have to, forgiveness has a way, has a tone, a voice of supplication almost to someone and saying to them, I please, I want you to forgive me. I did wrong. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I, I made, must have made you feel horrible. Acknowledging what the consequences of what you did to that person. And I, I think I, I, I may share with you the story with this um, rabbi, and it was in Poland, the place in Poland, this rabbi in the synagogue, uh, the, the, the Baal Tefillah, the chazen, chazen, the one who sings and knows music, he's, chazen embarrassed the Rav, right, sometime, you know, in, during the year, he embarrassed him. It's coming Yom Kippur, and, and, the, and the Rav demanded that this chazen should ask Mechila publicly, because he embarrassed him in public. And he should say, following, quote, I did something wrong, and I have to ask forgiveness from the Rav. 
So, seems to, everybody was kind of adrenalized to see this big day coming and happening and this big event. And they're rushing to Shul to see it on Shabbos, who's right before Rosh Hashanah Kippur. And he goes, gets up on the oven and he says, I did something wrong? I have to ask the Rav forgiveness? So the Rav goes over and says, what's going on? He says, listen here, Rav. The words, you could tell me what to say. Nigin, I'm the chazan here. So sometimes it's the voice that makes the whole difference. It's the way you express your request for forgiveness. Not, it's, it's, it's not open to interpretation. It's strict, absolute forgiveness. I'm asking you, I did wrong. I acknowledge I did this. I could have done otherwise. Mr. So-and-so, I did this terrible thing to you. I know the consequences of how it impacted your family, how it impacted you, how it impacted your business, v'chulu, 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 v'chulu. and I'm asking you, Mechila, accept my imperfection as part of the perfection of the human creation. That's what the Shulchan Aruch means, and that's what the Rambam means, also Adam to be an Arsu, not to be Moichel. That's what the Shulchan Aruch means also, that lo yehei, you should not be, whether it's prohibited or whether you shouldn't, that's what they mean. You shouldn't forgive. You shouldn't hold back forgiveness. Um, sometimes, uh, I mean, the Gedele used Bali Musa said this many times, actually, that when a person comes to, especially when a person comes to the nadir of, of, of human behavior, he's like the lowest point of his interactions, and and and. Um, and then he decides to pick himself up, makes a decision, you know what, I really got to change. So the first step he makes is to go ask somebody, ask somebody for Mechil, that he hurts his feelings. His feelings. The person says, no, I'm not Mechil, I'm not Mechil, you. You're no life, you're no good, I don't want to. That, what he did to that person is probably worse than whatever, not, not if you murdered him or, he, or who knows what else, but it would be worse of a crime than what that, that person who embarrassed him at one point did in the past. Um... There's a lot to say about forgiveness, mechila. But there's more to do than to say. We covered a, a lot of areas about what, how we're to react to mechila. We covered the responsibility of giving mechila, issuing mechila, what that means, issuing forgiveness. And we covered the reasons why people hold back asking for mechila forgiveness. The value of asking mechil, as we know, how it just the, the, the wife is 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 recognized, is validated that the husband did something wrong, or vice versa, the the husband is validated as the wife did something wrong. Living with the concept of of the perfection of imperfection, saying the wife saying to herself, you know, my husband is a human being, and he's actually a perfect human being because he's living the perfection of imperfection, and I can and he knows that. There is a caveat. The Mishnah in Yuma says that you, you shouldn't ask Mechila, it's only a Mechila to ask Mechila more than three times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, because the Rambam says a person should not hold back, oh, the Rambam says it's also to, not to forgive. So the Svas Emes writes in Yuma that a person who asks more than three times is doing an Avera because that is a Vilif Neiver on the person not being Mechila. Fully blame. So he asks Mechila three times, sincerely and genuinely. You could look at the Sassamas and you, you know, I, 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 I hope you wouldn't trust me alone and that what I'm saying to you. And somebody would look it up inside the Sassamas and see himself. Where is the Sassamas? It's in, I think in Pevov and Yuma, and where the mission is, better than the The last thing I want to share, because you had asked me uh, when you were on the way coming here, about is there anything that Shiva doesn't affect? And I want to share this because there's a common error. Based on, the, based on the Gemara, and not the Arizona and the Gemara, the Gemara's understanding of the Gemara, that one of the things that, this is very, two very important you say this, I want to share with you. <clears throat> the Gemara says in Kedushin, HaMakadosh Yasha Amanas Shani the Gomer. A person made a c- conditional engagement with a woman. A conditional betrothal with a woman. He said, I'm a Tzad the Gomer. So the Gemara adds, says, even if he's a Russia Gomer, which means a Russia Gomer means a Russia Gomer. Is Mukudesh it's a valid Kedushin? Because maybe he thought, maybe he had repented in his heart. Maybe he felt terrible. 
He didn't verbalize it to that person, but maybe he repented in his heart. So the so so the old Achreinim asked the Kasha. The Gemara says in Brachis, "Im reis the Talmud Chacham Shofar Veri Balayla." If you saw a Talmud scholar, Jewish scholar, do it very night. Do not think about him, suspect him, because t- tomorrow morning he's already probably did chuba of what he did. Well, so that's only talking about if it's mil deshmaya between man and God, but mamanis m- m- between man and man. Adam Mahadal Lamar has to give it back. And it says also by, if you hurt a person's feelings, you must be Mephias them. You must go and console and make them feel better. So how does that, how could the Gemara say it? I'm an Asha, he's had the Gemara, he's a doubt the Kedushin right away. You have to first see if he does what he has to do to get forgiveness. Mm-hmm. So Bechonah Wasm says something that's profound. And Rabbi Yashibah Salvechik from Yitzhak Achonan says, says this also in his Sefer, Madoid Dich Midoid. And I want to tell you this, what I'm telling you now, is Halach Alamaisa, Mishmu, I think, says it's the same thing in Ebenezer. We should remember this. He says that it's true. There are two concepts, though. There is repentance and atonement. God may not forgive a person and hold them responsible until he actually goes to the person and, and asks him forgiveness and gives him back what he's required to give back. But from this moment on, gave it back or didn't give it back, he is a tzaddik gomer. So when we see somebody who does tshuva, but what about all the things he did in the past and he didn't yet make up for those things? Mm-hmm. Okay, so that Hashem deals with him with his atonement. But his kap- from now on, he's considered a tzaddik gomer. And the man, the victim of his thuggery or, whatever, or thievery may go to Bezin and take him for the past money that he's due to him to Bezin still, but he's not a Russia. He's, he's a man who did tshuva who owes a debt and has to be taken, has to, pay, has to pay the debt. That's a fascinating concept. And the last thing that I thought I wanted to mention to you was um, there's a story with Rabbi Sosalanta. If the world would sing this kind of, live this kind of life, it would be a song to the Rabbi Shalom. Rabbi Sosalanta, in his shul, there was somebody who found out that he committed a terrible, terrible sin violated one of the major tenets of Yiddishkeit. So that year, this person would usually get mafta yayna. It's a chashiv aliyah. By mincha, mafta, he would get that aliyah. So the Gabbai asked the Rav, and they didn't give him mafta yayna that year. First year. Next year comes around. Mincha. And the Gabbai is about to call somebody else. So Sosalanta waves to him and says, come here comes over, he says, why don't you give it to the person mm-hmm. who missed last year, give him back his mafta yain. He says, but he did something terrible. He's a, not, not a good person. He's, uh, he violated one of the major tenets of Judaism. He says, what's wrong with you? He said in Yiddish, should I live Yom Kippur? One Yom Kippur passed already. How could you, how could you deprive him of this mafta yain? Should I live Yom Kippur? One Yom Kippur passed already. Parents, I know you're looking the way you're looking because you're amazed to feel how far we are from that concept. We are so far from that, Rabbi Shosalanta. What would we do if we had him? To, we, it would be everything in the world if we had him today. The last and most important thing I must say with you, and this one I'm going to close, is that nobody is rejected by God. People are in the assumption that a chil Hashem has a shalom in the kapara. So he's lost. If a man committed a chil Hashem, only thing is death. Death is machaper. Or, it says clearly, a Kiddush Hashem is one of the things that's machaper, a Kiddush Hashem. Mm-hmm. I think I saw Rabbi Yoshev says, you could, you could, the Kaddish Hashem Shemayim, if a person supports financially or in any other way, a Kiruv institution. If you support and you get involved and help in Kiruv, that's called Kiddush Hashem. Nothing to do with stolen money, obviously. Well, I'm, th- I'm talking about money. I'm talking about just some of Machal Shem Shemayim in some way, uh, another way maybe, and whatever it may be, and that this person could go and do Kiddush Hashem by being involved in Kirov. But beyond that, Kiddush Hashem atones for Chil Hashem. The Shai Tshuva Ben Yena, Shai Dalit, people don't, not, are not so aware of this, it says Talmud Torah is Mechaper for Chil Hashem. Ben Yena Rabbi Kvega once said about the Shari Tshuva of Rabbi Yaina, I'm afraid of the Shari Tshuva of Rabbi Yaina because it's not just a Musa Sefer, it's a Psak Halacha. 
to be Kivega said that. Not not some local rabbi, to be Kivega said that. And the last thing is Meshachachma, the great Osamech. Osamech, as we put in the use the word, the Shivas, that's how I would say, we sit at Leib and Leib, our Kishkes tremble when we think of who Osamech was, as a Goyna Ador, a Tadik Ador. And he writes in his Sefer, and you can look it up again in Pashas Vayelach in, in Meshachachma, that Tfilas Ne'ilo has the power, I'm not saying it always does automatically, but has the power with a person's true tefillis to, to, to be a kapara for chil Hashem. And all of us should be mechazek ourselves in this ultimate blessing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu telling us ki lo yidach mimenu nidach no one is turned around from the kisi covered turned away, I'm sorry, no one is turned away from the kisi covered of the Bari Elam. All of us should have a blessed year and learn from these lessons of these great tzaddikim that share these words. They're not mine. I'm just transmitting what it says in the Sarm of the G'dayli Yisrael. And in Mitzvah Shem, if we could learn how to forgive and how to ask forgiveness, mi yaydeya, who knows how great we could become. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi Leib